Okay, welcome back to Unsolved No More. So today we're going to talk about the unsolved homicide of Nikki Benedict. Nikki was a 14-year-old white female who was in the eighth grade who was an unfortunate victim of an unknown assailant in Poway, California. So again, this case is difficult because all cold cases are difficult. They're cold for a reason. Uh, but in this case, there are certain specific things that we, the general public, don't know about. And because of that, the assessment could go different, a different way. Meaning, uh, in this case, there was a purse involved. Uh, if the purse was ripped or where it was in location to a body. Or for instance, in this case, we know she has two stab wounds to the chest. Well, in a very important um, detail would be, are the stab wounds through the clothing or under the clothing? Meaning the clothing was, that's very, very crucial. So some things we don't know, which makes this assessment a little hard, but hey, the whole goal of this is to Keep that name, Nikki Benedict, out into the public. She has family still uh, that care about her, care about this case. And we want to bring it to the forefront because you never know what information can be made available through this platform. So that's why we do these deep dives, for no other reason than to keep that case alive. So with that, what I want to do is start out with the newspaper article because when we don't have police reports, that's where I go. I don't go to somebody's blog because I don't know who they are and I don't know how relevant it is or how accurate it is. Same thing could be said for a newspaper, but I will take a newspaper article, especially from, in this case, 1967, compared to today. Just call me crazy. I, I just... I think newspaper articles were more accurate back then than they are today. The media is just more accurate. Maybe, maybe not, but that's how I do things. So, sit back for a couple minutes here. Listen to the newspaper article. Watch the visuals so you get a feeling of who Nikki Benedict is. And then we'll go into my assessment. Daily Times Advocate, Escondido, California, Tuesday, May 2nd, 1967. 14-year-old student fatally stabbed, suspect lacking in Poway girl's death. The San Diego County Sheriff's Department has no suspects yet in the fatal stabbing of a 14-year-old Poway girl whose body was found on a dirt road in Poway late Monday afternoon. Captain Warren Kanagi of the Sheriff's Department Homicide Division said today that his department has checked out many leads, but none has materialized. The girl, Nikki Alexandria Benedict, 13530, Olive Tree Lane was found about 6.30 p.m. sprawled on a narrow trail about 125 yards west of Carriage Road and 125 feet north of Poway Road. Max Murphy of the San Diego Coroner's Office said the girl was found by an 11-year-old boy who ran to a nearby service station and reported it to Harry Adams, the station attendant. Adams told deputies he called the Poway Fire Department, which took the girl to Palomar Hospital by ambulance, where she was pronounced dead at 7.15 p.m. by Murphy. Murphy said the girl died of multiple stab wounds in the chest. It was not immediately known whether she had been thrown from an automobile, but it appeared that she staggered about 50 yards before she collapsed, Murphy added. Sheriff's deputies said no weapon was found at the scene. It was reported this afternoon that a size 12 tennis shoe print was found near the scene where the girl was found. 
Murphy's office said the girl was on her way home from visiting a girlfriend and left the house about 6 p.m. She was described as a blonde with blue-green eyes by L.E. Wilkes, a Poway fireman, who told deputies the girl was unconscious when the ambulance arrived at the scene. He said she was about 5 foot 5, wearing a plaid dress sneakers and no socks. Murphy's office said an autopsy was being conducted in San Diego. Kanagi is being assisted in the investigation by deputies Tom Johnson, Donald Benner, also the homicide division. She did more than the rest. Nikki was the most responsible member of the family. She did more than any of the rest of us to keep the family together, said Russell Benedict Tuesday. She was quiet and serious. This year, since we moved to Poway, she had just begun to find herself. She was interested in art and was finding she had quite a bit of talent. She was getting good at photography too. She did a lot more than I ever did around the house. Fixed meals without being asked. She was the most responsible of us all. It's two crimes really. She died by a violent accident. That's one. Somebody killed her. That's another. We all feel so bad, but there's somebody who must feel worse. The mother of whoever did it. As 16-year-old Tavina Benedict spoke about her younger sister, who was found fatally stabbed in a field near the home Monday, she petted one of four baby kittens in a box in the bedroom. The younger sisters, Barbara, seven, and Marianne, five, kept close to one parent or another. They seemed to feel the need to close ranks. Stephanie, 11, sat on her bed, crying quietly. Nikki was an 8th grade student at Meadowbrook Intermediate School. Teachers know her mostly as a quiet, reliable girl who did her work and got good grades. The principal and vice principal knew her by sight, but had never really had much to do with her. She hadn't been at the school long, and she never had been in trouble. After school Monday, Norma Kirby homemaking teacher at Meadowbrook, stayed with a group of girls to work on a special project in the homemaking lab. Nikki came in and asked if she could stay in the room. Since it was open, she wanted to work on a composition. Mrs. Kirby said yes. Nikki worked quietly until the homemaking session broke up at 4.30 p.m. There was a late activities bus and she could have taken home, but she chose to walk to the home of a friend, Kathy Gomiski, on Hulper Road. The two girls went to a nearby drive-in for a snack and returned to Kathy's, staying together until it was about 6 o'clock, time for Kathy's supper. Nikki started home on foot over the hill. Meanwhile, Russell Benedict had returned home from work. He is a self-employed consultant with the Office of Economic Opportunity in San Diego. His wife, Julie, a North County reporter for the San Diego Independent, also was home from her office in Escondido. Nikki's parents were just going to start looking for her. They weren't worried. It was bright sunshine, and Nikki wasn't the sort of girl you would worry about. However, it was supper time, and she had never been that late getting back from school. Her mother started down the driveway at about 6.30 and run into a neighbor who said he was going out to help look for a man who stabbed a girl. This girl's body had been found in the field. There was a purse nearby. Green suede, he said. Julie Benedict knew the impossible had happened. It was her daughter. Although the police never confirmed it until 10.30 p.m., she was sure because of the purse. It was made in Mississippi, and there probably was only one like it in the Poway, Nikki's. We've only lived here about six months, Mrs. Benedict said. Hardly long enough to have made any friends. We certainly have no enemies. We just have no idea who or why. None at all. Benedict, turning his face away from a moment to control his grief, said there was nothing anyone could wish to have done differently. Kids walk across that field all the time, he said. If I had been driving home and seen Nikki and she'd said, Dad, I'm walking home this way, I would have said, see you at supper, honey, then driven off. I want to be real sure that nobody at the school, no teacher or official, even spends a moment thinking if only I had made her take the activities bus or anything like that. All she did was perfectly normal, perfectly safe. It just doesn't make sense. Times Advocate, May 4th. 1967. The San Diego County Sheriff's Department has set up a command post at the Palmerdo County Water District offices on Poway Road to facilitate the search for clues in the fatal stabbing of a 14-year-old Poway girl Monday. The girl, Nikki Alexandra Benedict, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Russell Benedict, 13530 Olive Tree Lane, was found near death with two stab wounds in the chest about 6.30 p.m. on a dirt trail west of Carriage Road and north of Poway Road. She was pronounced dead at Palomar Memorial Hospital at 7.15 p.m. On the same evening. Sergeant Allison Wood 
of the Sheriff's Juvenile Division is in charge of the command post near the scene of the slaying. It said today that detectives have completed the search for clues around the immediate area. He said that about 30 detectives worked Wednesday throughout the day and night conducting a house-to-house -house investigation of the slaying and they currently are talking to Poway residents who may have leads in the case. Wood said that at this point the murder looks like a thrill killing possibly done by someone living near the area who knew about the dirt trail. He added that the murder possibly could have been committed by a teenager with no apparent motive. Officers found footprints near the murder scene and have checked the shoes of all 8th grade and high school boys in Poway schools, none matching the prints at the death scene have been found, deputies said. Detectives and deputies Wednesday also searched for any possible clues in the slaying around a wide and two square mile area of grassland surrounding the murder scene. Wood said that any person with possible clues could contact him or another official at the command post. Times Advocate, May 5th, 1967. Blanks drawn and probe of Poway slaying. No clues have turned up in the slaying of Nikki Alexandria Benedict. 14-year-old Poway girl was fatally stabbed on a dirt trail in Poway late Monday afternoon. Captain Warren Kanagi, San Diego's chief of detectives today, denied a report that new clues had been uncovered, but said that an extensive investigation is continuing. He said about 20 detectives are still conducting a door-to-door -door search and investigation in the Poway area, operating out of a command post at the Pomerado County Water District offices on Poway Road, near the scene of the slaying. The girl, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Russell Benedict, 13530 Olive Tree Lane, was found near death about 6.30 p.m. Monday. She died at 7.30 the same evening as a result of two stab wounds which penetrated her heart. Services for the victim were held today in Poway. Graveside rites followed by Dearborn Memorial Cemetery. Times Advocate, January 22nd, 1968. Slaying Suspect Quiz. A Poway man arrested Saturday and charged with the rape of two Claremont Mesa women is being questioned in connection with the May 1967 slaying of a 14-year-old Poway girl. The 21-year-old Miramar Naval Air Station sailor was arrested Saturday after he allegedly attempted to enter an apartment in the Claremont Mesa area. He was apprehended by Thomas Hudson after he reportedly saw the sailor attempting to remove a screen from a bedroom window. Hudson, armed with a shotgun, retained the suspect at gunpoint until policemen arrived. At the San Diego police station, the sailor was charged with the recent rape of two women in the same area and with committing several burglaries. San Diego police said today that the suspect has lived in the San Diego area since 1966 and is being questioned in connection with the death last year of Nikki Alexandria Benedict of 13530 Olive Tree Lane, Poway said. The young girl died from stab wounds after her body was found on a dirt road near Carriage Road and Poway Road. Times Advocate, June 22, 1969. A status report on the investigation into the unsolved murder of Nikki Alexandria Benedict, a Poway 8th grader whose body was found in a weed-covered field one evening two years ago, was given to the Poway Rotary Club at a meeting Thursday. Warren Kanagi, a chief sheriff's deputy who was asked by the club to make a report, assured members that the investigation is continuing, but spoke more about general police methods and other solved cases in San Diego County than about the Benedict case. Kanagi passed around aerial photographs of the murder area and told of the number of deputies, reserves, border patrolmen, and other law enforcement officers who had worked and are working on the case. He also said his department has a 16-inch thick wedge of files containing information and testimony, but never did he mention the victim or anyone else concerned by name. He suggested that homicides or murders often are solved many years later, and that every new piece of evidence, even a description of someone arrested in another part of the country that fits a suspect, is followed extensively. He also said in cases like the Poway one, reluctance of residents who volunteer information to the police is often the chief drawback in finding evidence. Law enforcement involves citizens as well as officials, he said. So there you have it. Very detailed report. There's a lot of things that we can get from that newspaper article. Um, so Nikki Benedict, again, 14-year-old, 8th grader from Poway, which is I assume is close to San Diego, because when I was looking up the weather and the uh, sunrise and sunset on this particular day, it gave me from San Diego, so I'm assuming that's the closest big uh, city. So, as you've learned from that newspaper article, Nikki was murdered 
going from one location, her friend's house, I believe on Helper Road, to her home, which was on Olive Tree Lane, which is crazy because Olive Road, Olive Tree Road, also was where Darlene Hulse's body was discovered. So many coincidences, and yes, they are coincidences. There are some people out there that will say, oh, well, then that means they're connected. It was the same suspect that... <sighs> anyway, she was going from Helper Road to her place. There was a shortcut. Uh, it was a water uh, service road that connected, um, and she's taking a shortcut home. It was a two and a half mile walk, uh, but in today's day, we're like, ooh, that's long. But listen, people walked all the time before we became a lazy generation. So it's not unheard of for somebody to walk two and a half miles, especially a 14 year old girl. So this happened May 1st, 1967, again in Poway, uh, California. Uh, her victimology is that of a 14-year-old girl that was very responsible. She loved art. Um, she loved science. She was, her mom was some sort of journalist, a writer, and uh, Nikki was starting to gravitate that way from what I could gather. Um, very level-headed, according to her sister. She had siblings, and she was... She took, as you could tell from that newspaper article, her father said that she took on a lot of responsibilities around the house, cooking and cleaning, um, doing those things without being told. It's a sign of a responsible uh, person. She had no enemies. Now, another thing that is very important here is that they just moved to that location about in Poway about six months previous. So that is another indicator that she didn't have a lot of time to make enemies, but I guess some people would say, well, you only need a day, you only need an hour to make enemies, uh, which is true. But she just wasn't that type of person. Um, but she obviously was there long enough to at least make a friend in the person that she, whose home she was at. And I believe her name may have been Kathy or something to that effect, but it was the girl's house on Halper Road, and we'll get more into the timeline as we go on. Um, she had attended school that day, and she normally would ride the bus home. And on this day, she did it because she was going to the friend's house, and then she was going to walk home. Now, I have that written down here as a red flag. Now, why? It may or may not be relevant, but to me, when anything happens out of the ordinary in a victim's life, especially hours um, before their demise, it is of importance. Uh, think back to Lori Zimmerman case. And if you haven't seen that, please go back in the library of videos and check it out. Something knew on the day that she died as well. And it was, she was moving from one house, one area to another. And I believe that she caught the eye of somebody in that area. It was a red flag. Again, it may or may not mean anything, but it, in, in that case, I believe it did. In this case, I don't believe so, but it has to be, it has to be annotated you have to follow up on it. Uh, it's a red flag, something unusual. If she took the bus home 356 days in a row and everything's fine, and then the one day that she doesn't take the bus home, she dies, something happens, well, that's a good place to start your investigation, right? So I have that written down here. So on this day, she did not take the bus home. She went to her friend's house. Um, she, and this was probably around, I want to say, 4, 4.30. Her body is found then at 6.30 p.m. on this service road. And I'll get into more about the crime scene and stuff like that. But 
Um, I just want to illustrate the narrow time gap that we have here. 4.30, she's at the friend's house. Now, what do they do at the friend's house? This is of importance. And I've only seen this in one of the articles. And they did leave her house, which I have written down as a red flag. Now, again, maybe, maybe not, but something that has to be followed up on. They didn't just stay at the friend's house. They actually went to the drive-in for a snack. And this had to have occurred between 5 and 6 p.m. 6 p.m. is when she leaves her friend's house for the two and a half mile walk home. Um, 4.30 is when she left the school. So it has to be between 5 and 6. So just an hour and a half max before she's killed, she does go to a drive-in. She goes to a public place to get snacks. Now, why is that a red flag? Well, when we determine whether through GSR, greed, sex, revenge, not GSR, the um, chemical kit that we'll do on shooters to see if they fired a handgun, gunshot residue, no. Greed, sex, revenge. What does this fall under? We can go back and see if that 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. trip to the drive-in for a snack may play into this. Maybe not but we have to annotate it. So between five and six, they do that. We don't know what they do there. I don't know what they do there. The police, I'm sure, because they've interviewed the friend, but she leaves. She starts her walk home. She starts, she goes off of the main road onto this service road because it's a shortcut to her house, as you can see here. And I found this image on the internet. I did not make this one myself. I usually do, but I couldn't find any of an old uh, map of that area. But this illustrated it very well. So credit to who, whomever did it. I hate using things that other people did. But at, anyhow, I digress. Uh, this map shows where she was approximately murdered. So it's a, it's a secluded location, but yet... People know about it. People use that road a lot. So it's not like it is in the middle of a forest. Um, it's not, it's, it's a, like a field. Um, it's not like a bunch of big pine trees or anything like that. So that tells me a little bit something about the offender. And when we get into the criminal profile, I'll, I'll let you know a little bit into my thoughts about the offender, but she is murdered on this road. No, she did not make it home. And when she's very level-headed, very responsible, and when she wasn't home for dinner, parents obviously got worried. The mom went outside, you know, and started to go search, and she ran into a neighbor who was leaving her home, and she said that she was going to look for a suspect that had murdered a girl and it was this girl's daughter she didn't even know you know it's sad so very sad um can't even imagine what that father went through my prayers were certainly out to him i know he's probably deceased now but still something you'd never get over the girl was found she had been stabbed twice in the chest. And again, very important, were the stab wounds through the clothing? Or if the clothing has no stab wounds in it, well then you know her shirt was either off or pulled up. That's a very specific detail I would want to know because it could change everything. We don't know that here. We just know that she was stabbed twice in the chest. Uh, the medical examiner said there was no sexual assault. Now again, just because there is no sexual assault, it does not mean there it was not a sexually motivated crime, right? Um, and we'll get into that because that may play a key role into determining what happened here. Um, 
the only evidence at the scene appears to be, and again, police could keep this close to their vest, was some footprints. Um, but the road seemed to be traveled a lot that it's hard to tell what footprints would belong to the offender and what was an innocent bystander. But I did read that they checked um, teenagers from that school uh, shoe prints. So it, that must have some credibility as to evidence in this case. She, there was no indication I said of sexual assault. I, I did not read whether her clothes were disheveled, but what police did find on that service road were, were three key things. One is there was a depression in like the grass and they indicated that as if like somebody was hiding as if this was a random act maybe um, I, I have to take police word for that meaning that's what the depression was there was a second location where a struggle obviously took place much like Sherry Jo Bates case back in the day where you could see that the stuff was turned up the uh, gravel and stuff like that um, and then a third location where there was a second struggle and the stabbing took place okay and then finally she Nikki wanders staggers 200 yards I believe is 200 yards could have been 200 feet um, 200 feet before collapsing and that is when she is found by I believe it was an 11 year old boy who was coming home from baseball practice or something and he went and got his dad to get help Nikki was loaded in the ambulance they kept her alive until she reached the hospital where she unfortunately passed away so actually there's four different locations there right which have evidentiary value or at least to me tells us something and they do she had injuries that were consistent with a fight what does that mean it just means there was a struggle it doesn't mean that she squared off with somebody that's not in her personality but she should certainly could do that um, but just means there was a struggle she was grabbed she was thrown down she had scrapes on her arms you know bruisings on her elbows her knees whatever it is consistent with a struggle slash fight um, okay I, that plays into a scenario when I tell you what I think happened here at the end but that's all that that we really we have in this case we have her victimology which tells us she isn't a high-risk victim it also tells us that uh, she didn't have any enemies she was a nice person she had just moved to that area six months previous um, good girl just a good teenage girl not a runaway not somebody that's out smoking she didn't even really she didn't have a boyfriend she wasn't into boys yet you know that's about the age where this starts happening um, but just because she wasn't into boys doesn't mean that boys weren't into her right so that's an aspect that investigators have to look at so what when I look at the case I, I seen a couple things in the newspaper that the police said one that it was a thrill kill meaning somebody just killed to kill you know no no rhyme or reason well those are rare meaning there's always a reason behind it and usually it's greed sex or revenge now when I look at this case I can I can cross off the R I don't believe that it's revenge at all she wasn't there long enough. Now, she didn't have a boyfriend. She didn't steal somebody's boyfriend or anything like that where somebody would be out to get her. A jealous teenage, you know, jilted lover or something like that. I don't see that here. Uh, the manner 
and cause of death, stab wounds. The stab wounds are not as important as to how many. Okay, there was only two stab wounds to Nikki, and they are to her chest means the offender is facing her either on top of her which is more likely or standing in front of her um, but that that tells you that there is no the, pro, the uh, proverbial overkill that people like to use which I believe is mostly nonsense uh, because you can't tell by the number of stab wounds whether it's people say it's personal when you hear people say that well there was 187 stab wounds it was personal when you hear an expert say that on television shut off the television because they don't know what they're talking about you cannot tell by the number of stab wounds whether something is personal or not an example is the person could have fought back like crazy and she wouldn't die. So the offender had to keep stabbing her till he knew that she wouldn't move anymore. And it took 187 stab wounds to do that. And he didn't know her. He was a stranger. So how's that personal? The problem with the last, I would say, 40 to 50 years of criminalists and, and true crime is nobody challenges these narratives. They just take it because, you know, John Douglas and Bob Ressler interviewed some offenders in the 70s who said, yeah, I, she was an ex-girlfriend and I had so much rage that I stabbed her and stabbed her and stabbed her. So they took that model and said, okay, if we see other crimes that have 187 stab wounds, we have to think back to the, our interview with that guy, and he knew her. So it has to be personal, when that's not the case. Now, certainly all due <clears throat> respect to FBI criminal profilers like John Douglas and Bob Ressler. I mean, you see their book behind me, and I go to it a lot, and I believe that they are the authority, but... Sometimes, as society changes, some of these narratives have to be challenged because they're simply not true. <clears throat> so you can't go off of that. Does that make sense? So two stab wounds may tell me something when we get to that. Um, we talked about the crime scene. There, there was no sexual assault, but that doesn't mean it's not a sexually motivated crime. Um, two struggle scenes, I mean, an initial struggle and then a second when she was stabbed. Now, what does that tell me? It tells me she got away. You know, if the depression in the grass was what that really was, somebody lying in wait, he jumps out, you know, there's a struggle, she gets away and runs, but he catches her, and now, instead of a second struggle where nothing takes place, he stabs her. And then he, he runs away. There was, a, there was a witness who said they saw a young man run from that area. Um, but that's all that they could tell. In my mind, that is 99% the offender. Now, again, I'm having a hard time assessing this completely with 100% confidence because of some details that are missing. She had a purse with her, and her purse was unique, her mom said. That's how they knew that this was going to be Nikki's body that they found because they said they found like a green olive plaid purse or something, and she knew that that was Nikki's. But... I want to know where was that purse in location to Nikki's body in the first struggle. So I have two thoughts of what happened here. Um, greed, sex, or revenge. Let's go back to that. We got rid of revenge. 
it's either greed to me, which is robbery, or sex, which 90% of these cases seem to be. Um, that's a little high probably, but um, at least on this channel, that's what they seem to end up being. I can't discern one way or another which one this is because I can run scenarios that fit both. So let's first start with the sex and why this could be a sexually motivated crime or B, although no sexual assault took place, there's the potential that it could have. So let's say that um, this may or may not been, have been somebody that Nikki knew. Maybe not close, maybe peripherally, maybe an associate. Um, but to me, it, I, I think that is key that it has to be that in this scenario, meaning a sexually motivated crime. Because the location of that roadway, number one, if the offender knew that it was, he had his eyes on Nikki, he would to have to know or have been stalking her so much to know that she was going to take that service road. Because remember, normally she didn't. So that leads me to believe that it was probably not that scenario unless, remember the drive-in diner? If, if somebody was out trolling for a victim or, what, or had their eyes set on Nikki uh, and was stalking her and followed her and her friend to that drive-in and then overheard her say, no, I'm just going to walk home, and I, I just take that shortcut. Well, the offender would have to be from there, probably, to know what that shortcut was. Because, remember, there was the depression in the grass where he probably laid in wait. So then he goes there, he waits for his opportunity, he sees Nikki, um, he's going to sexually assault her. Because, remember, there's no other reason right now we're not looking at robbery, we're, and we ruled out revenge, so it's, it's the sexual uh, motive that we're looking here. She fights back, she runs, she gets away, he chases her, and then stabs her twice, and then flees. Now, why would he stab her twice, you know, when she got away the first time? Why didn't he just cut his losses right then and there, and say, well, she got away, I tried to you know, live out my sexual fantasy, um, and she got away, I just let her go, and I'll run. But he doesn't. He catches back up to her and kills her. Well, to me, it, statistics, I think, would show that it's because she could identify him. Not necessarily 100% true, but I think statistics would bear that out. Now, that is looking at a sexually motivated crime. If this was a fantasy-driven, sexual motivated crime, much like I believe and have believed since day one on the Idaho murders uh, that Koberger locked in on one of them upstairs, either, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember their names, Maddie and I want to say uh, Katie, but it's not Katie, but... Um, the Gonzalez girl and that was the motive for that I'm not going to get into that I've done enough videos about that um, so a fantasy driven homicide where Nikki is the intended target now it's, po it's very possible and I think maybe this is the route the police are thinking is that it was a sexually motivated crime and Nikki just happened to be an innocent victim walking by where the offender isn't keyed in on Nikki. He's keyed in on whoever walks by there. He sees a good looking girl 
um, or a vulnerable girl, he's going to react. Um, I can't discount that either. That can be a fantasy of an offender as well. A fantasy offender of for the offender doesn't have to be that he's locked in on a girl. That certainly happens a lot. But his fantasy could be, you know, hey, this is the type of girl that I want to have in my fantasy and eventually make it a reality. A uh, schoolgirl, eighth grade blonde hair. And maybe he laid in wait there and waited for other girls and none of them fit his fantasy. And then finally he saw somebody and acted out on it, right? That is certainly a possibility and maybe even a probability uh, as to how this occurred. Now, there's also the possibility, and this is a, it, to probably a little bit lesser extent, a robbery, greed, where an offender lays in wait, he sees somebody walking by, he's going to rob them, um, she has a purse, and she fights back, he stabs her again, probably because she could identify him. Now, you, you say to yourself, why? That's so dumb, Kenny, because why would anybody rob a 14-year-old girl? Well, why not? Sure, an experienced offender, criminal, may not do that. But certainly, whoever did this, I don't believe was experienced. So uh, when I get into my criminal profile, uh, I'll tell you how that plays into it, uh, not being criminally sophisticated. Because, quite frankly, if you were an experienced criminal, or an ex at least an, an experienced murderer, like a serial murderer, you wouldn't let her go with two stab wounds. You would ensure her death. Remember, she got stabbed twice, she didn't die. She wandered away 200 feet before she collapsed and died. If Defender was experienced, he would have slit her throat. He would have stabbed her in the throat and made sure she couldn't talk. She couldn't walk. She couldn't get up. But that didn't happen here. So that tells us something about the offender. Okay. Um, so I can't discern whether this is a fantasy-driven homicide, sexual homicide, or a robbery. I can't tell that. Again, I know as dumb as you think it sounds, a robbery, once I get into this criminal profile, you'll hopefully see what I mean. <clears throat> so based off of just what I know, I would say that this offender is more than likely a teenager or an, a younger adult, meaning in their, in their 20s, but possibly with like a learning disorder. Now you're saying, now, now, you're, now you're pushing it, Kenny. How does that crime scene tell you that? Well, I look at the time of day when this happened at six o'clock at night, probably 6.15. This is May, so it was still light out. The average temperature uh, ha play doesn't play into it at all uh, that I looked at, but it was still sunlight, and that does play into this because I believe it shows you that the offender is not, not the smartest, meaning he's doing this during broad daylight. And it's not, I mean, it's a secluded area, but it's not, it's, it's used all the time. The offender had to have known that it was there. Nobody from out of town is just gonna stumble and lay in wait on this service road for somebody to walk by. That makes zero sense. So I, I'm just saying it seems like it's a, a first time offender. And more than likely, I don't believe that they had the intent to kill anybody. 
I feel pretty strongly about that. It was more either fantasy, like I've been thinking about doing this. I've been thinking about, you know, sexually assaulting, accosting somebody here at this place. This is the best place for it. People walk. I can get away with it. Um, and then you finally implement it, but it goes wrong. It doesn't go because she fights back. And then maybe in his fantasy, it was, hey, she, you know, I approach her and say, can I walk you home? She says, sure. And then we become boyfriend and girlfriend. In the offender's mind, that's what they think. Or is it more than likely that this offender, during that time of day, it was his first time that he was going to commit a, an easy robbery and wait till he sees somebody, she had a purse, I'm just going to take it and then run. And if that is the case, I would look for a, a teenager who has not yet dabbled in crime that much, but probably has an older brother that he looked up to that was already a criminal. Maybe not a hardened criminal, but, you know, if this kid was probably 14 years old, his brother would have been 17, 18, something like that. Um, and he's learned from his brother, sees that his brother commits these acts and talks about them and he wants to be like his brother and he's going to prove that he can do it just like his brother but he makes mistakes he wasn't expecting the girl to fight back um, you know and he was prepared he had a knife with him and she probably knew him from school and she, he stabbed her and you know, under panic and ran away. Much like Betsy Ardsma. Remember that? That me and Bill Nagara talked about the uh, girl that was stabbed in the Petit Library at Penn State University. Hey, I'm wearing this as well, Penn State. Um, much like that. I want to go back quick to address what I said about learning disabilities. I didn't mean as in mentally challenged. What I meant is this seems to me to be a teenager, but I said if they were in their 20s, 20 to 25 year old range, they would be of slower uh, learning abilities. Much like Jason, was it Jason Miss Kelly from the West Memphis Three? A reduced IQ, but obviously still function. Um, that's all I meant by that. Um, but more than likely, I would say a teenager and it was his first criminal act. He probably had other criminal acts such as vandalism, um, throwing rocks at houses, cars, whatever it is, but no, nothing like this where confrontation would take place. I just cannot make up my mind whether it was that, you know, a young teenage kid who has a brother who's kind of demanding or, but the younger brother looks up to him as a hero. Uh, he probably, his dad, he doesn't look up to, his dad probably beats him, never around, whatever. So he looks to his brother and his brother is already a burglar, a criminal. Um, I, I can't decide whether it's that or if I go by statistics that it was a sexually motivated crime and the sexual fantasy just never got fulfilled because she fought back, ran away, he stabbed and she and he left. I, I would be a fool if I sat here and said I knew which one. I can't deduce it that far um, based off of the information we have. I just have those two camps. And, and that's where it is. And that's where I have to leave it because I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, but I still think that it's one or the other. And I'm not a psychologist, but I've studied enough um, to know that I, 
remember when I, I, I said before that I don't like going off hunches, you know, because people would ask me that. Does the, do detectives have hunches? Yeah, sure, we do. But I think the older you get, you, you try not to rely on those because they can get you in trouble, okay? It could lead you down a wrong path where it, it, you don't want to go. You want to stick to the facts and stick, stick to the evidence. But in this case, my hunch does tell me something about this robbery and him having a brother. And I'm, listen, I'm not trying to be psychic here. You know, all know how I feel about psychics. I don't believe in them, okay? Um, I don't, but just the crime scene, only two stab wounds, and he flees. He doesn't ensure her death. Um, to me, is very inexperienced and, and teenage-like. The whole, the whole assault, the three different areas, you know, just seem kid-like. Even the depression in the grass seems like that is something a kid, a teenager, would do. Um, and if that is the case, it just leads me to believe that he would have an older brother that he looks up to, and he's a criminal. So that's what I would be looking for in that area. There's no doubt the offender lives in that area because he has to know about, even if he was stalking Nikki, well, if he was stalking her, he had to be from that area. Um, you have to know where that service road is. And I think everybody did. It wasn't a secret. But the... It wasn't somebody from out of town. So I would start looking, and I'm, I know the police did this, okay? But I would narrow that down even further, okay? Start within, let's say, Nikki was walking two and a half miles home, right? So I would double that, and I would go out to five miles from that service road and start looking for siblings, okay? Brothers ages from 14 to 18, something like that. And I would start there. That's where I would start my investigation. And if the, uh, that older brother had a criminal record of burglary and robbery, and he has a younger brother, <laughs> that's where I would be honing in on. See, because if, if that is the case, and if that is the, the scenario, and greed, sex, and the revenge, and it is greed, it's robbery, that younger brother is trying to, he's trying to please his older brother. And he's trying to show him, hey, I can do this too, okay? No, you can't. You're just a kid. Don't do it. Don't stay away from it. No, I can. And I'm going to prove it one of these days. And then he builds up the courage to finally go out there and sit and wait for the perfect victim. And the perfect victim may be any female that he feels that he can dominate. You know, you don't want to rob another 14-year-old boy because he could fight back and he might be able to kick your butt. So let's choose a female. She has a purse. Perfect. I can take that purse back to my brother and say, look, I told you I could do it. He waits. Maybe he wait. He waited there the night before, two nights before, and he just he didn't see the perfect victim. Maybe there were other people on walking that, whatever it was. But on May first, nineteen sixty-seven, at six fifteen p.m., everything lined for him, and he reacted. And it didn't didn't go smoothly, you know. It's like Mike Tyson said: everybody has a plan till they get punched in the mouth. Maybe that's exactly what happened. She fought back. He caught up to her, pinned her back down on the ground, and stabbed her twice. Maybe because of anger. It didn't go the way I wanted it to go, and now I'm angry. Or maybe witness elimination. You know me from school. <coughs> now again, where's her purse at during this struggle? Is it there where she was stabbed? 
Was it left at the first initial struggle site? Or was it where her body was found? Or was it nowhere in between there? Because if it was nowhere in between there and the offender took it, you would say, hey, well, I, this is why I did this. So I am going to take it home. But what if on the way running with it, he decides, you know what? I didn't mean to kill her. I don't, I'm in some big trouble and I just toss it. It's a likely scenario. Because there was no sexual assault, I feel an experienced offender would have sexually assaulted her. Okay? Meaning, a 25-year-old experienced offender, even if she broke away the first time, the second time, he gets her down, he has the knife to her, instead of stabbing her twice, he holds it to her throat and he rapes her. That's what an experienced offender does. He's there for that reason. And it doesn't happen. He doesn't even dishevel her clothes. He doesn't lift up her shirt. Doesn't pull down her pants. Nothing like that. It's just two stab wounds to the chest. That, again, leads me back down to an inexperienced offender. Sure, you could have an ex inexperienced offender who's 25 years old, certainly. But again, I said, if that's the case, I think he would be just, his IQ wouldn't be as sharp because things just didn't go right here. <clears throat> I hope all of that makes sense to you, okay? Um, I wanna go down over my notes here. 13530 Olive Tree Lane, that's where she lived. She was found in the 20 or 12700 block Poway Road is where she was found, that's what I have written. Her friend lived on Halper Road. For victimology, when he went through, stabbed twice in the chest and again, through clothes, I'm assuming that that's what it's going to be, but I'd like to know for sure. I have under greed, sex, and revenge. It's not revenge, so it's greed or sex. I can't determine which one. The evidence, shoe prints, and she had injuries consistent with the struggle. The profile, <clears throat> first time offender, probably a teenager um, or late, I mean early 20s possibility of a learning disorder. I'm, I'm not confident about that. It's just the crime scene itself tells me that it seems like it's somebody who's not very bright. Um, and because, and the, the reason of that is because of the time of day. It's almost broad daylight. I mean, it's not noon, it's 6.15, but it's still daylight out. And you're gonna commit this act then. That's not very bright. Somebody just doesn't, you know, is not experienced or not very smart. I have here, he had an older brother he looked up to who was a thief or a criminal. I have no, I have no evidence that backs that up other than just everything that took place at the crime scene, the time of day that it took place. Uh, the, it was a Monday. Uh, that's just, it's what my hunch tells me. But I'll be the first to tell you that I do not like going on hunches. But in this case, getting it out to, you know, the quarter million people that watch this a month, um, that, hey, if you know somebody from Poway from 1967 who had a brother um, and was fits that criteria, well, then this helped. So that's why I'm putting that hunch out there. Um, would I testify to that in court? Would I, if I got called to court as an expert witness, would I say this about the older brother? No, I certainly wouldn't because I have no evidence to back that up. It's just a hunch and I wanted to put that out to you know, my subscribers and they can forward it to whoever they want to. And I don't normally put out hunches, 
But in this case, I felt it relevant, and that's why I did it. Red flags. She usually took the bus home. We discussed that. The drive-in for the snack between 5 and 6 p.m. She lived there for six months and only two stab wounds. Those are all red flags to me, and I think we fleshed them out. Um, she staggered 200 feet before collapsing. That I have under deductions. Well, why is that a deduction? Because whoever did it, I can deduce, is inexperienced. Because they panicked, they fled. They didn't make sure that she was dead. You know, So to me, that's an inexperienced criminal. The final conclusion, it's a sexually fantasy-driven homicide or um, robbery. Greed was the motive. Um, the first sight is she struggles and she breaks away. The second is a stab, uh, two stab wounds out of anger slash or rejection or elimination of witness. Young man seen running from the scene. He was most likely the offender. The purse nearby. I don't know what that means. I want to know where that purse was. That could change the whole assessment as well. Uh, it was the water department service road, and it is not visible from the main road. Well, I sure would like to go there if it was still there and walk it and, and, and get the feel. Again, going back to the crime scene is paramount. Um, I don't care if it's 100 years later. For me, it is. You just get the feel of it. Get the feel of the land. You know, see what the victim saw. See what the offender saw. Uh, it's so much, I don't know. I had a, an old case that I, I had worked for a good six months probably where I just read the reports. That's all I had access to was the police reports. And you read it and read it and read it and you visualize all this stuff. And I had it like a movie in my mind. And then I finally got access to the photographs <clears throat> and, go, and I had access to the house. Completely changed everything. And that's when I knew it's imperative to go back to the crime scenes. So I would like to do that in this case as well. So that's what I see in the Nikki Benedict case. Um, my thoughts and, and prayers are certainly with Nikki's family. Her sister, I watched an interview that she did. She's affected still by this. And the reporter asked a stupid question, like, why do you continue to go on? What do you expect her to say? She, said, she gave the answer, wouldn't you? Because that's the perfect answer. Why, why would you give up? Somebody hurt your sister. It's unsolved. We can solve it. Um, so my thoughts are out to the family, as usual. And I hope this helps somehow. Again, getting it out to people, thinking of my hunch, maybe it fits somebody in that area. Um, and then, you know, you couple that hunch with the assessment, and maybe, just maybe, this case will be solved. And it'll be unsolved no more. And that's the goal move cases forward and uh, I, I can't imagine the pain that that family went through I, I, I really can't I mean I know that I lost a child um, but not too violent homicide and certainly there's a difference especially an unsolved violent homicide you know in my son's death I know what happened okay it, it's there, it's happened, over. These people, they don't know. And that is the misery of unsolved homicides. Is no matter how much you think you get closure or resolution, you never do. And you certainly don't when the case is unsolved. This is 1967. It's somebody in that town you know, they had to be on foot or on a bike, you know, but more than likely on foot. They ran away. It shouldn't be that hard. It shouldn't be that difficult. But unfortunately, as a detective, it is that difficult. Um, but together, collectively, everybody, maybe we can, you know, make it not so difficult 
and try to track down who's responsible for this dastardly deed. So, with that said, hey, thanks for another uh, edition of a deep dive on Unsolved no, no More. I will be starting True Detective Talk live starting either this week or next week. So stay tuned for that where we'll talk all things true crime every day, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's a regular talk show. And uh, we'll get more of these cases out there and we'll talk about more of these cases and we'll talk about um, specific areas, staging, uh, criminal profiling, deduction, evidence, all sorts of topics. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching. And to Nikki Benedict's family, my thoughts and prayers are with you. And if I can help in any way, please get a hold of me, and I certainly will try. Okay? Mains out. Yeah.